host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad that you're joining us again today. Today, we're very pleased that we are on the beautiful island of Maui with Dr. John C. Lilly. John is a world-renowned adventurer in consciousness. He is an MD, he is a psychoanalyst, and he is one of the leading pioneers of all time into the domain of consciousness, understanding our own, as well as that of cetaceans. And he's done an extreme amount of work in bringing to general awareness the importance of the cetacean world and has set up something called Cetacean Nation, which he'll be speaking to us about, and has made forays into worlds that uh, few people will ever see in this lifetime. So we're so glad to have you on the show, John. Terrific introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Not to mention, by the way, uh, he is the author of a series of books. We can't even show them all to you. This is the one he feels is the leading among them. If you can get a close-up of that. Programming and metaprogramming in the human biocomputer. And a lot of work in the world of dolphins. The dolphin in history, for instance. And I can never forget, tanks for the memories. As many of you know, I have been involved in the world of flotation tanks and flotation tank therapy for many years. And for that, I owe Dr. Lilly a tremendous debt, as we all do, for those of us who have uh, ventured into that area and have used them extensively over the years. John is really the founder of the flotation tank. I was the um, head of a division in the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, I was the, um, I forgot the title I had, but anyway, I had a research lab there at Bethesda, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And that's where I invented the isolation tank in 1954. And you were working, though, with uh, a study or a research project involving weightlessness. I was interested in what the mind did in the absence of external um, stimulation. Stimuli. stimuli. Mm -hmm. So I invented the isolation tank for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what did you find upon that exploration? Well, the one that's most important in that regard is the deep self, um, which tells about the experiences of 500 people in the isolation tank. Difficult question as it is, how would you summarize the experience of those 500 people in the flotation tank, in the isolation tanks, from that study? Well, in the absence of external stimuli by known physical means, most people go internal and start analyzing themselves to themselves. And this varies over a whole spectrum of consciousness that people have. Mm -hmm. It's hard to summarize that. Of course, that's as varied as the people in it. Yeah. yeah. But the main point is that people go from essentially external perception and kind of a anchoring, if you will, outside to inside. And that shift is a remarkable shift for most people in their lives. Yeah, right. Something people tend to uh, avoid. Well, my um, wife at the time, Tony, was in the tank and suddenly got claustrophobic. <laughs> <coughs> and she burst out of the tank and then watched her claustrophobia go by. And got back in, and she was fine from that point on. Wow. <laughs> you know, a comment I made to you uh, recently was that uh, I consider this to be a true innovation over the spiritual practices we know from West and East. So this position just doesn't hold a candle, if you will, to the speed of consciousness change that occurs in the flotation tank. Right. Isn't that right? And Thank you. <laughs> I call it the isolation tank. Yes, indeed. I know. 
But in fact, what's funny is that once so-called isolated, you feel a connection to all things. So it's a, a bit of an oxymoron in a certain way. Yeah. Now, one of the adventures that you have embarked upon and become world famous for is your work with hallucinogens, psychedelics, in the flotation, in the isolation tanks. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what that was like? Well, the isolation tank in the Virgin Islands, on the island of St. Thomas, was eight feet deep and eight feet square. And when I first took 300 micrograms of LSD, I hallucinated a memorandum, memorandum from the National Institute of Mental Health. Never take LSD alone. One of the researchers took it alone and his tape recorder ate him. Mm. And so I got into a panic at that point. But I realized later that my fear had projected me out further into the universe than anything else had ever done. Mm. So that was a great experience. And from that point on, everything else was downhill. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's what accounts for the repeated use of the LSD in the tank. Yeah. A yeah. hundred times in two years. Now you kept fairly uh, detailed notes about your experiences. No. I didn't have to. I have a good memory. Mm -hmm. Well, you kept mental notes. Whatever you want to call it. Okay. Uh, what, if for someone who's never had any kind of experience of that sort, what is it that you feel they should know ahead of time? They get into a good isolation tank, the proper temperature and all the rest of it, and take the either ketamine or LSD after they get in, and then relax and enjoy whatever happens, and don't panic. Even if the world seems utterly, fantastically different than anything you have known theretofore. No, you're lucky if it's that way. <laughs> you're lucky if it's that way. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit, if you would, John, about your work with the cetacean life. And you've done a tremendous amount of research into the brains, nervous systems, languages of both whales and dolphins. How did you get involved in that in the first place? Well, I was floating around in the isolation tank at NIH one day, and I wondered who floats around 24 hours a day. And Pete Scholander, a friend of mine, told me to go to Marine Studios in Florida and meet the dolphins. And that's how I met them. Hmm. So we looked at their brains very carefully. Peter Marguin in my laboratory analyzed the dolphin brain, three of them, one in one dimension, another in the second dimension, and so on, and found that microscopically their brains are just like ours, that they were larger in the total cortex available. And the largest brain in the planet, of course, is this bird mm -hmm. That was a sample I wrote of there. Mm -hmm. So, what are the implications of the different size of the brain and uh, its particulars? Well, language as we know it is, in the human, starts at 800 grams, goes up to 2,000 grams. And language, of course, is a definite change of reality. As soon as you learn language, your reality changes. So I imagine that, with, for instance, or sinus, or, or, or sinus uh, the killer whale's brain was three times the size of ours, and the sperm whale's brain was just five times the size of ours. But there are various levels of attainment that they have that we don't have at all because their brains are too small. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that size is a, de a major determining factor e in intelligence? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how does language fit into that? In other words, are you suggesting that the language of dolphins is superior to yes. human language? Oh, yes. Well, how do you know that? 
I don't. <laughs> so why do you say it? Because you asked the question, I said yes. <laughs> you just came up with an answer. <laughs> but no, in fact, we don't really no, know. Wait a minute. I've talked, <laughs> I tried to talk to 200 gram brain humans. It's impossible. One woman spent 20 years with a 300 gram human and he learned 20 words. And I suggest then that the dolphins, the brain's larger than ours, and the sperm whale, the largest brand on the planet, have many more levels of language than we ever can think of to have it. Different levels of language within their, their sp not spoken, but more sung. Well, whatever. Auditory language. Whatever. Well, there are many different kinds of languages, nonverbal included. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with auditory communication. All right. You have your own way. Well, no, I'm, I'm asking a question. And you, could you then spell out the different levels you're referring to of dolphin communication? No, because I don't have those levels. I just know they're there, that's all. I have to make you a theory that they have them. And one woman that I know was in the uh, Bowser group I'm swimming with uh, sperm whales in the Indian Ocean where there's a sanctuary for them. And when she came back from that, I didn't know her at all. She'd been so transformed by that, con that communication with those sperm whales that she was a new, entirely new person. Mm -hmm. So I'm gathering that it is your belief that if humans put themselves into the context of being with dolphins that will have this potentially profound transformative effect simply by being in the atmosphere. Yeah, right. Do you feel that perhaps some of their intelligence in a sense uh, is almost contagious and somehow we receive their, through their communication a well, different level of frequency into our system. As a dolphin trainer in New Zealand, we used to stand beside the dolphin tank and visualize what he wanted them to do, and they'd do it. So there's a, mm. a communication with us and them, which is not spoken language, it's something else. Mm. Sounds telepathic to me. Yeah. How would that then explain those instances when someone would be around dolphins and they do not respond in such a similar way? Well, those people that aren't paying attention. People aren't paying attention. The dolphins aren't paying attention. One or the other. Yeah. What is the? Could you let the audience know about what it is you're doing with the Cetacean Nation? What it is, first of all, and what it's purposes? Well, we just got a tape from Australia in which uh, uh, Scott Taylor explains the station nation. 71% of the planet has oceans, and there are 79 species of cetaceans in those oceans. And they, of course, communicate with one another, but they don't communicate with us. There's only whaling, which is a warfare on them. Uh, if we got into the ocean and lived with them and learned more about how to communicate with them, I think they would put this thing on, on the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because of these facts, of the ocean being 71% of the planet's surface and the level of population and the type of population inhabiting them, you've decided to bring this to international attention and focus yeah. so that they could be protected as a nation. Right. There's a picture of the 79 species up there in the wall. Mm -hmm. Is it at this point that you are trying to get United Nations recognition? Yeah. And what is the current status of that project? Well, we have somebody who's volunteered to be the representative, Patricia Forkhand, who came in to the United States, and 
But we need more contact with people like Lieberman and uh, uh, the people that are going to be in power next in the United States. So after November 7th, we'll be able to probably get some more of that across. Yes, indeed. Of course, depending on who it is that wins that. Right. Well, I think that <coughs> he's Lieberman probably going to win. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Lieberman, as you were saying uh, recently, is a major advocate of whale and dolphin rights yeah, right. and protection. Mm -hmm. This is very significant. Yeah, we've been in contact with him on that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, what is it that you would like, uh, given this opportunity, John, to communicate to people who may not know the body of your work that well, or have not even come across your work over time. In the many years you have been involved in the adventures of consciousness that you have been with psychedelics, with the isolation tank, the samadhi tank, what message would you like most to, uh, to convey? Well, change your view of reality and get in an isolation tank and learn about yourself and, you know, move ahead and learn to know the cetaceans and go to the various dolphinariums and see the dolphins and see the killer whales that are there and identify with them more. And for Lord's sake, stop whaling. And, uh, you have to have captive dolphins in order to know them. And I had that when I was having dolphins. And there's one group moving over from Oahu. Uh, what's his name? Uh, well, anyway, he's moving his dolphins to Maui. Mm hmm. So they'll be available for people on Maui to uh, spend time with. Yeah. 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 Well, I want to thank you. Uh, number one for finding, discovering the isolation tank. And I think it's been a great, great benefit for the world that you have brought. And uh, the work with the cetaceans, etc., have been has been formidable. And you have opened up avenues of exploration and conservation that hadn't been considered before you've done your voluminous work. And uh, we all really owe you a debt for the pioneering work you have done. So, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's been great having you as a guest on the show. <laughs> well, I had fun with it, and I'd like to see a copy. Okay. We are now seated for the uh, last part of the show with Michael Bailey, who has been working with and a friend of Dr. John Lilly for many, many years. And this is because of a great sympathy they both have and feel very deep down, and that is for the protection and conservation of whales and dolphins. Michael has been working well with Greenpeace and other organizations for over 25 years and was involved in the first major protection that became world known of whales from Russian seamen. And he'll tell us about that because it's a stunning image that everyone has seen across the planet. It's really a pleasure to have you on, Michael. Good to be here. Thank you very much, Mitch. Absolutely, absolutely. Why don't you paint a picture of what it was, your first initial involvement with this, and why you got involved in this, of all things? Well, some 25 years ago, I was uh, a scuba diver and uh, kind of a, a touch of an adventurer, shall we say, in the... Uh, on the west coast of North America. No wonder you and John get along so well. <laughs> We've been on the high seas before in our own ways and <laughs> yes. done many things. Yes. Outer and inner seas. Outer and inner, that's correct. <laughs> and in this case, it was the outer seas in my particular instance, and it was dealing with the Russian whaling fleets that were killing tens of thousands of sperm whales, which as John Lilly has the largest brain on the planet Earth, the most biologically most complex, the sperm whale, a beautiful creature, and they're being slaughtered by the tens of thousands and were heading towards extinction due to the massive whaling by the Russians and by Japan and other nations. So I was one of the first people to initiate some of the campaigns to help save the whales. 
I directed the uh, the rubber raft that went in front of the Russian harpoon ship and when they fired their 90 millimeter cannon at the whales and exploded just next to us, just six, seven feet away. Those images rolled around the world of these somewhat perhaps crazy people running the real rubber raft in front of the harpoon ship and as they fired it at the whales and uh, and trying to basically place their lives in the line. It was it was a, it was actually more of a Gandhi inspired type of mission at that point in time. Indeed. And you yeah, know, non-violent. You were literally. I mean, inches or feet from from being harpooned, basically. Those were explosive-tipped harpoon cannons that they fired, and they had s thick steel cables on the end of them, and uh, sperm whales were 40 feet long. We were in a 15-foot dinghy with uh, just whales and waves and harpoons, and it was uh, a very challenging situation, and really challenging on the heart and soul, too, because I cared a lot, and as did the Your rest of Your life was on the line. All, all the way. Simply. I thought there was a pretty good chance that I wouldn't see the next morning, let's put it yes, that way. Yes, And what year was this? This was 1976 when I was first out there, and we first began the campaigns in 1975, and it's been, uh, it's been a, a long uh, progress for myself. I was over in Kuwait in the Gulf War during the oil fires and the oil spill that happened in the and Gulf War. And what were War. you doing there? I was initially over there to help rescue oil-soaked seabirds and the endangered wildlife. I then moved into helping people, because after the Allied invasion had occurred in Kuwait, the uh, Oil fires were burning rampantly, people were starving because many people actually didn't have food and water, and I was one of the very first, actually myself and one other person were the two first environmentalists, independent environmentalists, into the, into the country, into the field of uh, the theater of war at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And so I initiated efforts to analyze the toxins that were coming from the oil fields and to help structure an organized campaign to have the oil fires put out, and which we did, and we were very successful. And how did you go about that? It was mainly through lobbying uh, from the United Nations and from different United States agencies and <coughs> using the mass media to reach out to tell um, different countries and different corporations they should, that they should get involved and should basically be approaching the government of Kuwait and how to do this and how to, uh, how to arrange for their technologies to become more accessible. And as it was, we had uh, people from uh, Texas and from, uh, from across the world involved with that effort to help put out the oil fires. And, but my first initial efforts was dealing with the toxins, the chemical compounds, the, uh, the, the, the wildlife that was being devastated by it all, and then branched in directly trying to have the oil fires managed in a proper way. Yes. And of course, in a few other instances, like... What, it, what is incredible, Michael, is that there were two of you, at least to start with, yes. to manage this incredibly complex problem. It was incredible. Series complex. of problems. Series of... It, because we first went there just to help seabirds oil soaked seabirds in Saudi Arabia and then launched into Kuwait and then helped seabirds there and then helped people. We had Iraqi soldiers surrendering in front of us but you know, trying to beg for water and had to help to try to yeah. try to um, help that situation. It was a very chaotic situation and it was it was I, I was actually turned out to be very fortunate because as it turns out many people who I spoke with later did of course contract Gulf Wars disease which may be exposure to toxic compounds and even nerve gas or biological okay. agents. Okay. I came out of it unscathed as did the rest of my team but it was, uh, it was many many hazards were faced over there. Well what's interesting and I think this is important for people to see is that just a few people can make such a huge difference in the world in saving lives and saving wildlife. That's what happened. I, those individuals must be noisy must be noisy, they must you be know. directed, and quite honestly, must have the drive and initiative that it takes to go beyond the no barrier, as I call it, i.e., we decide we want to do something as a human being. Other human beings around us tell us, no, it cannot be done. Oh, you cannot do that. And there's a lot of naysaying and no saying. I'm a yes person myself. I say, yes, go for it. Yes, try it. Because even if you don't succeed all the way, you at least succeed part of the way, or maybe most of the way. And that's what really counts in this life, is being a yes person rather than being a no person. On that note, uh, I think it would be very instructive for the audience to know about work that John and you and John have been involved in, which has to do with the Cetacean Nation. And you have taken this ball, so to speak, and you have gone to the United Nations and petitioned it and got a unanimous vote in the General Assembly. Would you please tell us about this? Well, those are actually two instances. <clears throat> the, the unanimous vote, the first of its kind, happened now around eight years ago, in maybe nine, 1991, 1992, it was actually 1992. When and what the, was the uh, subject? The subject was drift netting, high seas drift netting. At that time, a, f a combined fleet from Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and some other nations were deploying around 30,000 of netting every night just in the North Pacific Ocean mm. alone, as well as the Atlantic Ocean, mm. many other thousands, the South Pacific. Mm. There were over a million dolphins a year were dying. Over two to two to five million seabirds were dying every year. The the salmon population in the northwest was collapsing. The tuna population of the South Pacific was collapsing. 
and there was other fisheries collapses also caused by these pl plundering fisheries that weren't just targeted for certain species, but were catching everything that couldn't swim through a hole two inches in diameter. Mm. And uh, those images was one of the things which I managed to garner by going on a organizing high seas expeditions to document okay. this and that resulted in a unanimous resolution in the United Nations General Assembly banning high seas drift nets and to this day at this point in time any drift net on the high seas is considered to be a pirate vessel. It can be seized by the United States Coast Guard or United States Navy or other military vessels on the high seas as being of pirates. Of any country. Of any country um, because they are viewed to be pirates. There is no high seas drift netting supposed to be allowed on the high seas. And has this been rather generally well enforced? It's been actually fairly well enforced, if, if for no other reason than the United States Navy needs to somehow justify their existence because they no longer have the Russians to fight, so they've got to be doing something out there, and now we have them involved with the drift netting saving campaign. Saving dolphins and saving whales! Saving dolphins and whales! Go Navy! <laughs> that's great. Hey, that's a useful function. Useful it's better function. than others they yes. could do, you know? That's great. And also now, if you would, in conclusion, talk to us a bit about the Cetacean Nation and what you have done, the inroads you have made with this project? Well, based upon that experience, at least my experience, with what it took to get that unanimous resolution in the United Nations General Assembly, uh, we've been moving on getting recognition for cetaceans as a nation, or basically kind of an international cetacean nation, because there's over 80 different cetacean species in the world. John Lilly, of course, was the person that first conceived this, the idea of dolphins under human laws and what rights they may have, because they are sentient beings and highly intelligent. and loving and nurturing and have many of the qualities that we respect amongst human beings. Yes, indeed. And as a result, the idea is perhaps through this century, the 21st century, we could branch beyond simply recognizing humans for all of our own human rights, but we could develop a certain step towards an animal right, so in this case, a cetacean right, uh, and have it be viewed as being cetacean nation or cetacean nations. And because of at least my experience with the United Nations working on that drift net resolution some years ago, there's a sense behind how that could be done, aligning different nations, uh, island nations and others around the cause, uh, having people in diverse countries get involved. And those people that really care could really make a difference now. Well, talk about making a difference. I want to thank you deeply for the work you are doing, this pioneering work, as very much in the spirit of John Lilly and uh, consciousness and the planet. In reality, there's no separation. <laughs> Indeed, Mitchell, there is no separation. We are all one. And of course, it can be seen simply because we breathe the same air as that the dinosaurs breathed years ago. Exactly. We drink the same water that poured upon the face of the planet hundreds of millions of years ago. Our blood is actually almost the same salinity as is the ocean. So we are indeed all part of this earth ourselves. That's right. So continue your good work. We bless you. <laughs> and thank you for what you've done so far. And I have a feeling it's just the beginning. And I'd love to have you on again in the future once you've got a few of the projects uh, under your belt. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Appreciate it very okay. much. This is Mitchell J. Rabin here in beautiful Maui on location to interview both Dr. John C. Lilly and Michael Bailey. We hope you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week.